second quest. <clears throat> We're going to call this lesson 26, which is lecture 20, developmental genetics. Um, and this will be the last lecture. I'm, I don't know how long this is going to be, but we're just going to power through it. Um, and obviously you can split it up if you want. So uh, this lecture is on developmental genetics. And so we all know that we came from a sperm and an egg fusing together to make a zygote. And that zygote differentiated into trillions of cells uh, to make us. So this chapter focuses on how did we go from a single celled organism to a complex being. Um, and this, this is the same for fruit flies and mice and a bunch of other stuff so um, if we look at the zygote right we have sets of genes so there can be genes that are how what we call housekeeping genes these are genes that um, you studied in hopefully in intro bio uh, things that are involved in like glycolysis um, because you always need to make ATP things that are uh, involved in like the oxygen transport um, you know cell cycle like any gene that's that's basically taking care of the house right it, it's make keeping you alive um, and then there are genes that are very tissue specific um, and those genes are going to be expressed differently uh, in different cell lines so this example here um, on this PowerPoint is basically all of our DNA is identical right in the zygote we're all the same in fact that's where the term homozygous for genetics came from because the zygote is has all the same genes right this is a this is a and everything that comes from there is the same so <clears throat> with these genes these housekeeping genes are always going to be on right because we always have to take care of you know making energy and you know importing uh hormones or whatever so the blue genes the housekeeping genes are going to be on in every single cell line it doesn't matter what it is because they need those genes on to live but if we look at other genes right maybe there's genes in this cell so let's say this is a brain cell and we need to turn the these genes on and maybe this is a lung cell and we don't need the green ones on we need these on as well and maybe this is a, a skin cell and in skin cells maybe we need these genes on and there's can be an infinite combination of these right so we're like at 20 to 25 thousand genes and these are going to be expressed differently in different tissues so this chapter focuses on how do we go from here to here because it certainly the differential expression of genes that makes everything different right all the cell lines different because it can't be the DNA the DNA is always the same and so what sets that up this differential gene expression and how is it controlled and we're going to explore that in this chapter okay so much like your television, um, and we've talked about this, it's the, the pixels on it are red, blue, and green. If you went up close to your TV, you'd see that those are the only three colors. I mean, there are some fancy TVs that have magenta, for, but for the most part, there's only that, three colors. But you can look at infinite pictures because those are turned on or off uh, in different places on your television. 
or simultaneously, and they um, they make all the different colors, so you can get all the different kinds of pictures. All right, different cell types express different sets of genes, so red blood cells are going to be different than muscle cell skeletal muscle cells, than uh, neurons, nerve cells, than skin cells for the blast. <clears throat> no surprise. So when looking, uh, remember we have model organisms in uh, genetics, and those organisms are going to be, uh, they're going to have a fast uh, generation time, and they're going to have multiple offspring. And it turns out the fruit fly is really heavily studied because it could, has a fast generation time and it has lots and lots of offspring. In fact, if the female adult laid an egg and that was fertilized, it would undergo embryogenesis in a single day to become a larva. Uh, and then from there, it only takes four full days uh, to grow into an adult fruit fly that's capable of reproducing so this is very very fast um, we talked a little bit about um, mitosis and then mitosis and, and then you probably should know this from a previous uh, biology class but in mitosis um, you have a cleavage furrow in animals and that divides the cells uh, so that's cytokinesis, but in Drosophila embryos, the cells don't undergo uh, cytokinesis. So they remain uh, in uh, the egg structure and the nuclei of different cells are able to share a common cytoplasm. So this full cycle, right, is about 10 full days from uh, being a fertilized egg to an adult fly that's ready to reproduce. And then it's one day uh, of embryogenesis. All right. So this is kind of a... Uh, images of so this is done with a scanning electron micrograph and so we're looking at the outside of the Drosophila egg this is the drawings so what's going on the inside whether we have a nucleus um, the nuclei divide in a common cytoplasm and uh, that allows them to uh, express mRNAs um, and those diffuse through the cell. So um, we continue to have these nuclear divisions without uh, cytokinesis until uh, we get a, a blastoderm. This this ta so this is a, this is about ninety minutes to get from here to here, and then. Uh, 150 minutes to go from here to here and then 195 minutes to go from here to here. So this is um, very quick and this is setting up the segmentation of the fruit fly. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. So there's notes down here, but basically, um, how do you want to look at genes that are responsible in development for uh, a model organism or a plant? And so, you know, this is going to talk about fruit flies, but this applies to anything. 
So you want to look for a mutant, like we've talked about, that shows some sort of weird uh, developmental pattern. Um, this is really hard to study in humans because um, you can't see a human develop, but you can see this in fruit flies and um, and plants and other organisms, and especially like C. elegans, which is a roundworm. So these are model organisms for development. Um, you guys already know how to mutate organisms. We already covered that in mutation. So this is how you're going to generate a mutant fly. And then you're going to need to establish a laboratory strain. So this involves back crossing. And um, I kind of tried to get you guys to do this in the one of the problem sets so that you can see that after generations, that they're going to tend, tend to be... Um, true breeding right they're going to be uh, homozygous uh, either dominant or recessive depending on what you're back crossing it to so you can cross them and you can establish a purebred laboratory strain um, and then you're going to look for the gene that mutated uh, you can do that through recombination mapping which we talked about or complementation testing which we also already talked about and then we want to look, look at the expression pattern of the gene and wild type versus mutant strains. So we can look at the gene expression pattern using a thing called in situ hybridization. And basically what that is is um, in the cell, we're gonna hybridize uh, an mRNA or a protein to another mRNA or RNA or even a DNA, probably a usually a DNA because they're more stable um, and that we can put a fluorescent tag on that so a floor fluorescent tag so that we can see it when it binds um, or we can use a protein and then generally if we use a protein we're going to use an antibody with a you know some sort of a fluorescent tag as well so that we can actually visualize it inside the cell so we're going to talk about that this is how um, they identified the regulatory genes involved in development and in in body parts so I don't care that you know who who discovered this um, but so let's just say this is in the 70s um, this uh, research uh, generated a Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine, so it's important. Um, all right, so if we want to look at, uh, so those guys were looking at fruit flies, and if you want to look at uh, the developmental patterns in a fruit fly, you can do it with mRNA, like we said. So. Uh, we know the sequence of the gene that we're looking for. You know, we've already done all the other tests. We're gonna make short uh, pieces of DNA, and the reason is because they're stable. So remember, so let's say our mRNA target is, I don't know, some, let's just call it nanos or something. Um, this is a developmental uh, mRNA, and we'll talk about that in a second. But let's just say this sequence is um, t wait there's no t's i want to make that an a c c g and then this is three prey so you you could order or design a piece of dna that had a complementary sequence and you would want this to be single stranded dna which you can order um, so this would be TT and then A, G, C, T, remember this is DNA, and then this is G, G, C, 5 prime.
So the there's lots of companies that will synthesize short pieces of DNA for you. And on the end of those, you could put a fluorescent tag. And let's see if I can uh, find one real quick. So one of the my favorites is IDT. So it's Integrated DNA Technologies. You can go there, you click on that. You want to order oligonucleotides, right? That means um, many nucleotides. And so uh, we want it single stranded DNA so we can get it in tubes or plates and we can get it expedited shipping. We just need a small amount, like 25 nanomoles is a whole bunch. Uh, so, so we can call this nanos probe, right? Because that's what we call a piece of DNA. Uh, it's kind of my to it. We enter in the probe sequence. So let's see. I made this um, five prime. So it's C G G T. C G A T T. C G G T C G A T T. So that's five prime to three prime. That's what we want. So you have to make sure that that's why you need to know five prime and three prime, because you're going to waste your money if you don't. And so we want the DNA sequence to complement our uh, mRNA. So we do G C C. Sorry. We did C, G, G, T, C, G, A, T, T. That's our probe. We can modify it. So we can add colors, uh, linkers, or whatever. This is all the modifications that we can do. And so generally, it's hard to modify a five prime end because we talked about that. You can't. It's uh, it's hard to do a dehydration reaction on that end. So most of the modifications are done on the good. Our sequence is saved on the three prime end. So um, these are different dyes. Um, this one's rhodamine green, so we could add this dye that's red, rhodamine red. Uh, they're not cheap, and you can't get it at that scale. So, you know, whatever. You order the pro, it has the dye on the end, on the three, usually on the three prime end, but you could get it on the five prime end. So let's say we, we have a green dye. And it's going to fluoresce green whenever we excite it with some light source. Usually it's like a ultraviolet light source. So we shine it on there. Um, it's going to emit energy when we put energy in. And then you'll be able to actually see it under a microscope. So um, let's go through this. So we have the gene. We know the sequence. We make the probe, the RNA. We we buy it, right? You're, I mean, you're not going to prepare it unless you have a sequencer or a synthesizer um, you're going to attach a tag to the RNA probe so if you're good at chemistry you could do that it's just easier to buy it then you're going to incubate those embryos um, with your RNA probe so the RNA probe should be able to cross into the embryos uh, it, they're multinucleated um, but you might have to inject them and then you're going to wash away whatever the so you don't want to have false signals in there. If it's not binding to your complement, you want to get rid of it because you don't want a bunch of background green fluorescence uh, in there. You want to make sure it's super clear. Um, this is for um, if you're if you're not adding a dye directly. So you can add another you know uh, compound here that will, you can make antibodies to. Or you can directly add the uh, the colored fluorescent 
uh, emitter right there. So then there's a, uh, if you'd use an antibody, you're going to have to have an enzyme that, that uh, reacts to that. So usually the antibody has a tag on it. Um, and that enzyme is going to react with that. And then it, you know, it could emit light or whatever, and you visualize it under a microscope. So this is a little more complicated. I probably should change the slide because no one in this day and age is going to go through this extra step of conjugating an uh, antibody to uh, an enzyme substrate. Anyway, so after all that's done, and I'm, I might ask you about in situ hybridization or fluorescent in situ hybridization, um, but I would be real specific for what I'm doing. So this is an example of what you're looking at for mRNA transcripts. And you can see that there's definitely a pattern, um, a banding pattern that's going on in Drosophila development. And all of these blue things are the nuclei of uh, a multinucleated egg. Right? The, none of these have compartmentalized yet. There's no cell membranes between these. So everything can diffuse through this uh, fertilized egg. Alright, so this is a, a fluorescent in situ hybridization uh, detection method uh, made by Stellaris. And the reason I'm showing you guys this is because you might want to be a geneticist and you might want to do developmental uh, genetics research and so you're going to need to know how to do that. <clears throat> I'm not going to show the video. Um, let me just see if it works. So it does. I, didn't, I haven't checked this. Out. Working on a research paper for school. As I work, I That's going to be super The large fish technology is a Okay, so anyway, this is this uh, technique is super bright, so you don't have to do a bunch of. Another thing, I guess I should say is that the antibody step, you can have lots of antibodies bound to an mRNA. So I take that back. You might need to do this if you have a really weak, weak, ugh, weak mRNA signal, because you can have lots of antibodies bind to a specific antigen. And so it would amplify your detection. Think about it like this. So let's say that you built a DNA probe. It would have one fluorescent uh, tag on it. So think about like one cell phone lit up at a concert. Now, if you use antibodies to do that, and then you could, you know, you could you could put multiple fluorescent tags on antibodies or have an enzymatic reaction with that. But if it emits light, then you would get a much stronger signal. So think about 20 cell phones lit up at the same time. That's going to be a lot brighter, and it's going to be a lot easier to see. So you might need this technique, the antibody technique, to your mRNA if you're trying to find very uh, non-prevalent mRNAs in a cell. But if they're plentiful then you wouldn't need to go do that extra step. All right, so hopefully that cleared that up. So again, you can do an amulo localization of protein expression. Um, it's basically the same thing, except you're going to, instead of ordering a DNA probe, you would um, take the protein, you could inject it into anything. So let's say that the mRNA is for nanos. And of course, if it's an mRNA, it's going to be, it's going to make a protein. And that protein would be nanos, which is involved in developmental regulation. And so you could take the, the purified protein for nanos, which 
we talked a little bit about um, in previous chapters, and then you could take that, maybe inject it to a rabbit or a horse or whatever, some vertebrate that would make antibodies to that, and then you would you could go and purify those antibodies. Um, you would need to conjugate those antibodies, so that means binding some sort of uh, fluorescent uh, chroma means colored, so colored fluorescent tag specific to uh, that antibody, so nanos. Then you'd wash away the unbound antibodies, right, because you only want to fluoresce things that are actually the protein that you're looking for, and then you can look at it under a, a fluorescent microscope. So that's the technique of doing it if you're looking at the protein itself rather than the mRNA. And then this is just an example of um, doing this technique in Drosophila genetics and Drosophila developmental genetics. All right. Okay, so these animations, um, and I'm certain that these work, but let me just double check because I haven't looked at them this semester. Okay, I think I have this in Chrome. And by the way, here's the trip operon, steroid receptors. Okay, Ryan Reynolds. Okay, so that leak doesn't work. Fix it. This one does. Okay, so those are the two. Um, you have to use the link in the pages to look at it, the first one. Um, and I'll fix this. But just so you know, the bicoid mutants, the maternal effects, use the pages link in Canvas. And then for the overview of genetic expression, that link is actually active. So those are just some videos, and you can visualize this. I'm going to try to go through it without animation. Okay, so um, we can ask the question. Um, so if everything, every fertilized egg, every zygote has the same DNA, then how does it know where to put the head and where to put the tail? So the tail is the posterior the head is the anterior and so the this might be like a chicken and the egg question right what came first the chicken or the egg well I know the answer to that it has to be the chicken why because without the chicken if there was no chicken the egg would never develop a head or a tail it would fail developmentally and this is why so bicoid which is an mRNA, which is turned into a protein. There's actually a fruit fly flying in this office. Um, anyway, it's called what we call a maternal effect gene. That means that the mom, the, the genetics of the mom, affects the genetics of the embryo. 
the embryo has whatever its DNA is has no control over it developmentally because it's all from the mom. So in fruit flies, and this is true for a lot of organisms, there are cells. These cells are called nurse cells. Those cells are uh, produced with the actual egg. And these nurse cells, their job is to make mRNA and put it into the egg. These mRNAs, um, at least in fruit flies, are called bicoid and nanos. Okay, so if we look at a wild type Drosophila, um, it would have a anterior and a posterior. But bicoid mutants are missing the anterior part of the larva. This doesn't develop normally. So bicoid or some, some people say bicoid I don't really care how you say it um, so bicoid is produced by the nurse cells and so let's say that this is bicoid here At, just like everything else we it's a uh, subject to diffusion so in diffusion we have close to the nurse cells a high concentration and then that diffuses throughout the cell. So this part of the cell is going to have a high concentration of bicoid or bicoid. And this is going to have, this part of the cell is going to have a low concentration. And if we knock out bicoid, then we don't get any anterior. So bicoid is in charge of the anterior part of the cell and nanos is the other end. Let me change colors. So that's going to be really highly concentrated here and diffuse out. And Nanos is in charge of the other. Okay, so this mutant phenotype. <clears throat> only occurs when the mother uh, doesn't have nurse cells that can make the bicoid protein All right so that's broken that gene is broken so it doesn't matter what the embryos is because it's not producing any mRNA at this point that comes from the mother cells at, totally. So that's why it's called a maternal effects. And it only occurs when the mother is homozygous for the mutation, right? So homozygous recessive in this case, because it's a recessive mutation. <clears throat> so during the development of the egg, bicoid is deposited in the anterior portion of the egg itself. Um, again, that comes only from the mother. And then those mRNAs are translated into proteins and those diffuse, like I just showed you, through the egg. Uh, so the, in Bitcoin, the highest concentration is at the anterior end. And the lowest concentration is at the posterior end. Just like I drew it here. Um, so this isn't the only maternal effects gene that's set up in this we call it the anterior posterior axis. Um, and then we also have a dorsal and a ventral side, which is the up and down. We're not really going to focus on that at all in this lecture, the up and down, but just know that there's other things controlling that, right? Uh, you want to know where your head and feet are, but you also want to know where your front and back is. So there's this is a complicated, there's whole classes on development. All right.
So this is the in-situ hybridization of bicoid mRNA. You can see it's very high concentrated in the a, this A stands for anterior uh, versus the posterior in. And it's going to diffuse out. So we're going to get, uh, so spoiler alert, bicoid isn't actually a transcription factor. Uh, it's in charge of turning genes on. Nanos is a transcriptional repressor. It's in charge of turning genes off. And we're going to show that in a second. And it's, so it's this uh, concentration battle between activator and repressor that we talked about in the previous chapter that determines what is turned on and where in the cell. All right. So these are the experiments that were done. Um, and so this is a normal developing um, Drosophila egg. We have bicoid in the anterior portion of it. So this is this is anterior, the head, so antenna, head, thorax, abdomen, um, and then the tail. So we're going in this direction. We have the anterior portions that are being made appropriately in the wild type phenotype. If the develop if the bicoid mutant is deficient, so th this is how it's written. Switch to red. So we have B C D. That's normal, and then we have B C D minus, and that's the mutant. So it has to be B C D minus B C D minus um, to and this is the only in the mother to be to not be able to produce any bicoid mRNA and therefore not produce any bicoid protein so or not produce a appropriately shaped or appropriate sequence for an mRNA so we we don't get the protein uh, so at a bicoid minus remember and this is a fruit fly, so it's diploid, uh, so it would be minus minus. It, if it's deficient um, in bicoid, we end up with two tails in essence. We never, it never forms a head. It, we never get an anterior, uh, anterior development. Now, if we have a bicoid minus mutant, which would normally develop like this, and we add the mRNA or the protein to the anterior end of the mutant, it develops normally. If we add it to the middle of the mutant, it gets a head in the middle and tails on the end. And if we add it to the posterior of the embryo in the wild type, we get two anterior ends. So this is very important in developing uh, an anterior or a head region in um, Drosophila. Okay. So we have the maternal effects genes. Those control the, the overall body plan, where the head and the tail are. And we're in, and we talked about bicoid or bicoid and nanos. Um, so there are also other genes, and we're not going to get crazy here, but you should know the the general class of them. So they're the general class are called gap genes. Gap genes control a very large segment. So those would be missing, and so in this case we would have just this portion connected to this portion and all of this would be lost. So gap genes cause a big gap in the developmental segments. Examples of this are Krupal and Knurps. Uh, these are names that a uh, geneticist made up because they, that, they thought it's what it looked like and they didn't necessarily have to be English. <coughs> um, there are pair rule genes, right? So when we're doing segmentation of body plans, 
uh, they develop as as pairs. So one, two, uh, so let's say one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. I'm just making this up. Five, five, and so on. And so this would be like the even ones. Uh, let's, let's, all right, let me do this. Let me renumber these. So let's say that this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So all these that are shaded, um, not blue, uh, orange or whatever color that is, these would be the even ones. And so they're getting skipped. They're, the even numbers are getting taken out. And so these are pair rule genes, right? The, this is all, this is odd. So we'll renumber this. We'll renumber this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So these would be missing the odd pairs rather than the even pairs. So this is called even skip. This is called odd skip. This will make more sense in a second, hopefully. Uh, there are, there's a gene called pair. So these are names of mutations. So there's an even skip gene, uh, mutation. There's an odd skip mutation. There's a, a paired mutation. There's a runt mutation. But these are all pair rule genes, right? They're causing these uh, groups of deletions out of the segmentation of the Drosophila. And then we have uh, segment polarity genes. Um, let me th think about a good example. Okay, so the parallel genes are going to delete um, the pair segments. There are 14 segments in Drosophila. They're not all drawn out here, so don't look for every single one of them. 14 segments <clears throat> in Drosophila. So the pair rule would delete the odd segments or the even segments. Uh, so you would get a shortened uh, fruit fly segment polarity so every segment has a front and a back to that and so the segment polarity genes their job is to make sure that within each of those segments the polarity is correct so the the anterior and posterior of each of these individual segments is um, made correctly not backwards and so that's what segment polarity genes do so just to recap we have the anterior posterior um, maternal effect gene which is bicoid and nanos And then we have the segmentation genes, which are the gap gene, the pair rule gene, genes, and the segment polarity genes. And that sets up the overall um, anterior posterior of the fruit fly. Okay, so the segmentation genes we're talking about, the mutants, parts of the embryo um, would be missing, um, and homozygous mutants, right? So, so these are all recessive. Um, they generally code for transcription factors. We'll talk about this. So the domains of gene expression are are refined. So obviously, we, I mean, we talked about this. So uh, we're going to get the segments defined, and you know they're even or odd, and so and then those are going to be more specifically refined. So we're going to get the general, which is the anterior posterior, 
and then we're going to have the larger segments, right? So, you know, uh, big parts of these segmentations. And then the next are the, um, hair rule genes, which are going to set up the 14 pair segments in the root of Drosophila. And then the next one is going to be the segment polarity. And those are going to set up those these 14 uh, pair segments in their correct orientation. All right. So we're going to cover this, but th there's a lot of things going on in the diffusion of this. I mean, I could word this, but I think I'm just going to show you exactly what's going on. And there's a video as well that you can watch um, to, to see this. So again, we have the, the bicoid or bicoid maternal effects gene. That is going to, in turn, affect a gap gene, in this case, a cruple. That gap gene is in turn uh, going to affect a pair rule gene. In this case, that gene is hairy. That's just the in situ hybridization that's shown here. And then that's going to affect a segment polarity gene, uh, which in this case is going to be in grail. So there's a specific order that's going on here. We have maternal effects, affecting gaps, affecting pair rules, affecting segment polarities. And again, this is showing you the order of expression from here to here. Hopefully that makes sense. So, <clears throat> again, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, so to speak, but we have uh, the maternal effects that are affecting the gap. A gap affects pair rule genes. Those affect segment polarity genes. Segment polarity genes... And we haven't talked about these yet, but Hox genes, these are homeodomains, uh, homeotic genes. And these determine the actual segments, what they're going to become. Are they going to become an eye? Are they going to become, uh, and we talked about antenna PD already, but is it going to be an antenna? Is it going to be um, a leg? Is it going to be a wing? So homeotic genes act downstream of these generally. Um, and that that's kind of what this is showing. It's not a great outline. Okay, so we're going to get into the, the actual genetics of this now. You have it over here. So... We talked about enhancers. This is bicoid or bicoid or bicoid. Uh, it binds to an enhancer. It's actually a transcription factor. It's an activator that activates other genes. So it's going to activate a gap gene, right? Because that's downstream, and that gap gene, this particular gap gene, is called hunchback. The hunchback product then binds to another enhancer. That's going to activate transcription of one of the pair rule genes, in this case it's called Eve, and so on and so forth. So I don't care that you need to you know this mess or whatever. I'm just showing you that they're interacting with one another. Um, and they're gonna be downstream factors. So these are gonna be the trans factors, right? And they're gonna to bind to these cis enhancer regions and produce protein product, which is gonna be trans, like we talked about. Okay, so when we talk about it, we talk about upstream and downstream. No surprise. So, bicoid is upstream of Eve. Eve is downstream of bicoid. All right, so this is just talking about the even skit, right? So, remember, we have... Um, Gap genes, pair rule, segment polarity genes. So when we have an 
the even skip gene, it's a pair rule gene. We talked about that because we have 14 segments. So seven stripes, the Drosophila for even, and then the other seven uh, are odds. So there are four enhancers around this gene that control expression of different stripes. Mutations on stripe two enhancer change the expression pattern of the second stripe. Um, each enhancer is contained binding sites for multiple transcription factors. So this is complex, and those are encoded by maternal effects and gap genes, which are upstream regulators. Okay, so uh, let's make sure this works. So again, I believe I have this in pages. There we go. So I'll see if I can find one and I'll make it in the announcements um, to show you these gradients. But we kind of already looked at it oops, previously right here when we looked at the, the downstream regulation of these. So it's not really that critical. And then this is going to be a explanation of this, and I'm certain that this works. Let me just 100% verify that. <clears throat> All right, well, that doesn't work either. But it doesn't matter. Basically, it's just a professor at Berkeley doing, covering exactly what I'm about to cover now. So... I'm just, it's just not going to have the fancy green screen that he has. All right. So this is how this, uh, these things work together to develop, say, an even stripe. So we're just going to focus on stripe two, which is shown here. And so this is bicoid or bicoid. Remember, that's the maternal effects gene. So it's going to be high concentration in the anterior which is shown here and it's going to reduce its concentration as we go towards the posterior all right this is giant so uh, giant is going to be expressed in this segment and this is croupal and it's going to be expressed here. So this is the embryo. And just a reminder, so croupal is a gap gene. Giant is also a gap gene. So this is gap. Yeah. Hunch back. Oh, these are gaps. Hunchback is a maternal effects gene. Um, and then this is the Eve 2 stripe protein. So I don't care that you memorize all this. I'm just showing you. I'm trying to pull all this together. So we have diffusion throughout the embryo, right? Maternal effects genes, uh, hunchback, and uh, bicoid. I'm just going to say it how I want to. 
And that in turn is going to uh, turn on or uh, repress certain uh, genes. So if we look at a, a Eve gene, um, so this is the stripe three and seven enhancer. This is the stripe two enhancer. This is the coding region, stripe four and six, stripe one and five. So they're uh, even, right? Um, stripes here, which is what we're going to talk about. So we're talking about stripe two, each stripe two. And so if we zoom into this, we can look at uh, this is an enhancer element, right? So it's far away from the coding region. This is the coding region that produces the proteins for the the Eve Stripe two protein. And so we have um, these all these gene products, these protein products, having an effect on this production of this stripe in this spatial gradient in the Drosophila embryo. So uh, KR stands for Kruppel, right? Kruppel is a repressor of the Stripe 2 enhancer. Um, Giant, which is shown here as GT, Giant is also a repressor. So we have another repressor. We have another repressor here, a repressor here, a repressor here, and we have an activator regions. This is from bicoid, and this is from hunchback. So when hunchback is present, the E strike two is activated. So if we look, um, we have hunchback present here. Um, we have bicoid present here. We change colors. This is so crazy. Actually, let's erase this. Okay, so we have bicoid here, which is shown in blue, right? And that is going to activate this gene, so it's going to be turned on. This, and the, remember, this is diffusing through the cell. This is present as well. Uh, that's hunchback, right? The green one. So that is going to activate the gene as well. Now we have repressors that are present. So this is repre a present at a high level here. So it's going to repress expression anywhere in this region of the the embryo, and uh, we also have giant which is here which is also a repressor and so giant is going to repress expression here so we're only going to get positive expression in this region of the embryo to produce the eve stripe 2 we're not going to get it anywhere else it's not going to turn that gene on it's going to be repressed, it's going to be turned off anywhere outside of this by these transcriptional repressors. That, by the way, are still in the same enhancer region for the genes that encode um, Eve's drive 2. Okay, so that's the end of the segmentation genes, and then the last ones are the homeotic genes or the Hox genes. So the Hox genes activate um, a body part in each of the 14 segments that have been defined already by the segmentation genes. So we have the maternal effects genes uh, affecting the segmentation genes, which we talked about. Um, in this case, we have uh, the gap uh, the pair rule and the segmentation polarity genes. Um, so the segments have been set up and then that in turn uh, activates these Hox genes and I don't care that you know them, all 
but there's Antenopedia complex that we've already talked about, and then there's a Bithorax complex that, as you guessed it, would produce two thoraxes. And so these are the 14 segments. Again, I don't care that you're memorizing these, right? But this is what it looks like because these are these have been compartmentalized. Let me just go back to kind of make sure you understand this. So here they're being compartmentalized to produce these segments. That's why it looks different. Um, again, here they're being compartmentalized. And so this is showing you uh, each of these genes are being expressed in a different uh, parasegment in Drosophila. This is the Antenopedia one, um, ultrabithorax, uh, abdominal uh, A and B. Again, I don't care that you know this. What I want you to know is the names of these and what would be their effect. So if I said a gap gene was broken, you would tell me that large sections of the embryo would be gone or lost. Um, if I uh, asked you what would happen if a maternal effects gene like bicoid was not present, what would be the outcome? What, uh, what about the uh, even, sorry, not even, what about the um, pair rule genes, right? So what would be the uh, outcome if one of those was knocked out? And then you tell me you get, you know, these pairs of segments deleted. <laughs> and then these are in charge of body parts, actual body parts. So eye, wings, legs, where they're supposed to be, number of legs, antenna, and so on. That's what the homeotic genes. So, you know, these, are, these can be uh, activators or repressors. We talked about this, so... Um, the the leg is actually repressed in antennapedia. Um, when that's mutated, we get no more repression, and so a full-on leg develops where the antenna should be. Okay, these are spatially restricted, just like everything else that we talked about, and then this is the image of this. So we have a head, a thorax, and the abdomen. Um, we've talked a little bit about this, so I'm not going to get really into much detail. These homeotic genes are present in individuals other than fruit flies, so in frogs. Um, we can have mutations in the these homeotic genes, these Hox genes, these home, homeo domain genes, and that can affect a, a number of vertebrae that we have. So it can also affect, right? So we're having repression and expression. So we could get uh, a vertebrate to turn into a middle vertebrate, or we could get an extra vertebrate. Uh, so those are the things that could uh, occur and of course, we know that homeotic genes will make legs from antenna, but it can also affect uh, the number of vertebrae and the position of those vertebrae. All right. So Hox genes, uh, once the segments have been compartmentalized, we have the 14 segments, uh, the orientation has been set up, uh, these Hox genes define the, the identity of each of the segments, right? So segments of fruit flies have uh, antenna, eyes, uh, a pair of legs. Another segment has a pair of legs. There's an, uh, another pair of legs, right? And six have eight, six legs. And we have wings, and then we have uh, the abdomen and the, and the c contents of that and so on. So if we have a normal fruit fly... Um, and, and, and in fruit fly, there's actually two vestigial wings. So fruit flies would have four wings. This is um, repressed in a normal fly. So it only has two wings. An ultrabithorax mutant, this is not repressed. So these, full, these wings, I don't know if you can see them. 
here and here. These are no longer oppressed, so they turn into full wings. Um, so you can have four wings, and that's not normal for a fruit fly. Or we can have the Antennapedia mutant. So this is ultrabithorax. Uh, we get an extra pair of wings. Antennapedia, we talked about this, you get legs for antenna, like full-on legs. And so mutations of Hox genes cause disruption in the identity of the segment what we call a homeotic transformation. Okay. I'm not going to get into this t too much in depth. I'm not going to, I don't, I'm not going to ask you many questions about this, but you should know ultrabithorax causes an extra pair of wings. So these vestigial wings that we just talked about, they're called hall tears. You don't need to know that. I'm not going to ask you about that. Uh, you might if you're a fruit fly genetics person, but the, those are going to develop into full wings if we get a mutation. So ultrabithorax is activated uh, when there's a lack of the hunchback protein, which we just kind of covered. So all of these genes, right, the, the maternal effects genes... Let me see if I can write better. Maternal effects those are going to I mean this is kind of again re repeating what we just said but those are going to affect the gap genes the gap genes are going to affect the pair rule genes the pair rule genes are going to affect the segment polarity genes and then those are going to affect the homeotic genes so there's five groups of genes involved in uh, fruit fly development of not only all the proper segments, but what those segments become. Eyes, antenna, wings, and so on. Um, I don't care that you know this. this is thorax 1, thorax 2, thorax 3. They each have a pair of legs. That makes them insects, so they're six-legged creatures. Um... Most insects carry a pair of wings, like a honeybee, but flies have it are in a different order. They only have a single pair of wings. The third thoracic sore uh, segment has uh, vestigial wings, which they use to balance. And again, I don't, I'm not going to ask you any of this on the test. I'm just telling you this so that you know. Uh, so, ultrabithorax is a selector gene uh, It regulates the on and off expression of other genes. So, it's kind of a master switches. All these genes that we talked about so far are in the transcription, transcription factor families. So, they can act as repressors or activators, turning genes on and off um, through the enhancosome that we talked about. Uh, ultrabithorax is no different. It encodes a transcription factor that's normally expressed in high levels in T3. Um, Antennapedia, again, that's uh, it's normally turned on. It's expressed um, in uh, the antenna. It's repressed in the head and normally expressed in the thorax to produce legs, right? So it's repressed in the head, and because of that repression, we don't get legs. We get vestigial legs that act as antenna. Here, uh, if it's not repressed, if the gene is broken, not, it's not being uh, expressed as a repression, then we get antenna. Um, So antennapedia is normally expressed only in T2. So that activates downstream genes in T2, including the legs, but uh, it gets turned on in the head region um, that form T2 structures, legs, and where antenna would normally be. So it's normally repressed 
uh, but it gets turned on and that causes uh, antenna. Yeah. All right, so we've mapped out these homeotic genes into complexes in Drosophila, Antennapedia, and by thorax, um, these correspond to the different um, segments in the Drosophila. Uh, the order of these are influenced by each of the homeotic genes, and so uh, this is one gene family that has arisen through gene duplication, which we kind of talked about already. Again, we've said ho Hox genes, homeotic genes, are they encode transcription factors that can be repressors or silencers. Um, the DNA binding domains, so these cis domains, right, not trans domains, those are the proteins. They're where, well conserved. We call them homeodomains. They're DNA binding domains. So if we look at the, the um, amino acid sequence here, we have the helix, um, turn helix, and helix loop helix uh, for these DNA binding, characteristic DNA binding domains. And another reason I'm showing you this is that you can see that this is highly conserved across all of the uh, Hox genes. So on the test, I might ask you, what's a Hox gene? It's a transcription factor. What is it? Um, it's a helix turn helix gene. Okay, so not just insects and vertebrates, but it also controls identity parts for the anterior posterior, these genes uh, in higher organisms. And if we look at so things like fish or amphibians, they have two sets of these. Here's a, this is a mouse. So it's showing you the mouse. Normally uh, mammals have four. Fish have two. And insects have one set of these hox genes. This is the Drosophila ones. There, you can see that these are conserved, right, throughout higher level organisms, and we get duplication events as well. So this is the the Hox genes. If we're looking at certain Hox genes, so this is the four uh, four B four. This one right here, or four. If we look at the sequence of that, you can see that this is the amino acid sequence. It's super conserved between flies, amphibians, mice, humans, chickens, frogs, zebra or zebra fish, however you want to say it. Um, so these are highly conserved genes. Like this is the gene, the protein uh, sequence is very conserved because it has to bind to and regulate those homeodomains, whether the gene is turned on or off and what body part that causes it to make. So I'm not, again, I don't want you to memorize all this. So, you know, don't waste your time. But but what I'm trying to show you here is that if we look at uh, homeotic gene, Hox genes complexes, um, you can see that in these lower level organisms, there's single uh, cluster of a single set of Hox genes so this is fruit flies, fruit flies, um, worms, mollusks, um, lower invertebrate organisms. If we look at things like mice, we have four sets of these, and this also includes humans and higher level mammals. Uh, if we look at uh, sea urchin, there are much few, uh, well, there's only one set. And then jellyfish, there's much fewer genes. So it looks like the more complex an organism becomes, the more 
of these Hox genes are present. All right, so if we look at these different things, and again, I don't, I'm not asking you to memorize these. I'm not going to ask you about these, but I'm trying to show you that this is relevant. So this hunchback gene that we talked about, um, it's a zinc finger, and we've talked about that. Uh, it's a gap gene. We talked about Krupal and NERPS. So gap genes, remember, they have they are responsible for uh, large gaps and the 14 pair segments. This is a transcription factor. Again, this is a, a zinc finger. The NERPS is a steroid receptor type protein, which we've already talked about. That's a gap gene. This is a transcription factor, which is a, a homeodomain protein, which we've already talked about. That's a pair rule gene. This is a, uh, so this is a scientist that discovered it. This is a homeodomain pair gene. So what I'm showing you is, is that these are transcription factors and they have different ways of binding to the DNA, which we've discussed, zinc fingers and so on. And then we have different uh, identity genes, pol segment polarity and so on. Um, remember, say no. so we have maternal effects. Just want to make sure this is, uh, we have this right, and I'm going to ask you this on the test. So maternal effects, uh, those affect gap genes, those affect uh, the pair rule, those in turn affect the segment polarity, and then the segment identity genes, these are the homeo box genes, right? These are, all of these are part of those ho the Hox genes that we talked about. They're all transcription factors, right? <clears throat> Regardless of what they do. Okay, so not all of the genes that are involved in regulatory development are transcription factors. There are some genes that are ligand binding ones. They never uh, enter the cell or cross the cell. This is extracellular, binds to a receptor, causes uh, a change. Maybe we have an inactive transcription factor that's phosphorylated, becomes active, that binds to an enhancer, turns on a gene. So uh, there might, there are genes that regulate development that are not actual transcription factors, but they in turn activate uh, or inactivate transcription factors. Here, this is showing a phosphorylation event that causes it to become active, that uh, binds to an enhancer that maybe activates or represses something else. So um, I'm really not going to ask you much about that. I'm just to let you know that that exists. Here's some examples of these. I'm not going to ask you any of those on the test. If you're a Drosophila geneticist, you might be interested in that. I'm not, um, but these are important. I mean, Drosophila is an, an important organism. So these genes have functional roles. They're activating transcription of a set of genes that are downstream that we talked about. These are highly conserved through animal evolution. They participate in different pathways over different species. Um, in the end, they are the genes responsible for an organism's development. And it's the cascade of those genes turning things on and off in a specifically defined way that allows it to uh, develop where you develop your head in the correct place, your eyes are in the correct place, they're not on the bottom of your feet, and so on. Um, and so any one of these genes could screw up, and that would cause, in most cases, failed development. Okay, so... Th 
instructions for gene expression are often received by neighboring cells. Like, so we talked about the Drosophila, we have the nurse cells, those are affecting, in Drosophila, they're not, com the nuclei are not compartmentalized. But in vertebrates, generally they are. So if we look at, like, say, the formation of appendages and vertebrates, those signals, those gene expression signals, are given off by neighboring cells. Um, the anterior posterior orientation of these um, appendages is established by a mass of cells called ZPA, which stands for Zone of Polarizing Activity. Um, they're located on the posterior M of say a limb bud. So here, this is a limb here. Uh, this is a limb bud. And so if we transplant this, uh, these cells or some of these cells, these ZPA cells to the opposite side, you develop an extra digit with a reverse polarity. Um, and so that shows you that these signals occur from the ZPA itself because that is causing a change in the fundamental development of um, appendages in vertebrates. So you can kind of think of cancer as a developmental disease. So we have the continuous development in adults of tissues and cell types that are constantly being replaced. Uh, we maintain our organs to and through controlled growth. Like if you had a, if you were going to donate your liver, that wouldn't continually be growing. But if you divide it in half, you would get two full new livers. And we know that the cell cycle um, is involved in, in the development of cancer. Uh, the differentiation of cells is also very important, right? So how cells become one cell. Uh, how do they know to stay with one cells? What's the signals coming from those uh, that tell your lung cell to stay in the lung and not go to the brain? Um, and then we have, you know, proliferation. We have spontaneous mutations that can affect these signaling pathways uh, to tell cells to turn on and off, to tell cells to stay where they're supposed to stay. And a lot of these genes were initially d discovered in Drosophila as developmental regulatory genes. And when we mutate them, those same genes can cause cancers in humans. So we're just gonna finish this up. So the last slide, again, I'm not asking you to know these or memorize these or anything like that, but I'm just trying to show you that these are important genes when you're studying like human or mammalian diseases such as cancer. So there is a signaling uh, component, a gene called wingless um, that we, we talked a little bit about. Uh, these are the fly equivalent genes. This is the pathway they're involved in. This gene, uh, catenin, is actually responsible for cell, cell adhesion and cell recognition. So uh, let's say that this is a lung cell. This is also a lung cell. Uh, these, uh, during development, tell the lung cells to stay together so that the lung is formed. Mutations in these cause these cells to not recognize other lung cells and move to different parts of the body. And that causes metastasize, uh, metastasis, um, which you would know, know as a malignant tumor. So I don't want to go through the whole list or whatever, but just to show you like, this is involved in colon and skin cancer and many other cancers, I guarantee you. Uh, basal cell carcinomas, leukemia, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, and so on. So a lot of these genes that are involved in these developmental pathways, when mutated, also develop into cancers in uh, higher level organisms like humans. So cancer can be considered a developmental disease.
All right, so I know this is kind of a long lecture. You can split it up or whatever you want to do. It's the final lecture uh, for the final quiz, developmental genetics quiz, which is posted. Um, this is all the information that you need to do the final problem set. And then um, your final exam will be during finals week. Um, it'll be exactly like all the other exams, except uh, there's some short answer questions. Um, I don't think there's any like serious essay questions on it. Uh, again, most of the test is multiple choice, and that's because it just takes me forever to grade those essays. So um, I, I'm not sure I'll have time to grade all that stuff, especially with the revisions on your other essay questions. But anyway, there it is. Uh, the end of genetics lectures uh, as you know it unless you continue on and take like molecular genetics or developmental genetics or anything like that so um, anyway again if you have any questions send me an email come to office hours um, I'll be happy to help you with uh, anything all right